thank you, Sammy, for that amazing introduction. Uh, and thank you for allowing me to speak with you today. Um, I, I was telling Sammy right before the presentation that uh, my typical way of presenting is kind of a somber tone because when we think about light poverty in the developing world, we think about people not having access to energy and light and what entails after. So my presentation today is going to fill you in on some of the ins and outs of why uh, light poverty and the products that are currently in the market in the developing world are failing and what we Light Up Africa are doing about it. So um, without further ado, um, a very wise person once told me to never give a presentation um, to people when they have empty stomachs. So is there anyone in the room who has not gotten food yet? If you haven't, raise your hand. Who has not gotten food? Anyone? Okay. Well, this disclaimer right up here just shows that uh, in case there's candy that's thrown out into the room, uh, no one gets hurt, okay? Um, and there's a little bit more of the smaller stuff down there, so don't worry about that. Um, but it's, it's, this is going to be a fun, fun presentation. Um, so by no means am I an expert. Um, and I'm not a big fan of the term expert. Technology changes so rapidly nowadays that for someone to call themselves an expert is, is it's not fair for the, the, the industry that they're in and for, um, for, for their specialty that they're following. So I'm not an expert, but what I am is I'm a humanitarian. Um, when I was a kid, all I wanted to do was be an adult, but probably not for the reasons you're thinking. Uh, as a kid, all of my heroes, Nelson Mandela, my parents, Mother Teresa, um, Gandhi, they were all old. So I thought as a kid, in order to change the world, I had to be old. Uh, I had to be wise and maybe have superpowers. I didn't know I was a kid. So now I am old, and uh, well, older at least. And the last time I checked, I don't have superpowers. Uh, but I have been given, given the unique opportunity to travel throughout the world um, and impact people's lives and get back more so um, by doing so. So this is kind of a brief snapshot of everything that Sammy, Sammy had mentioned. Um, and it all correlates around Light Up Africa. When I was a kid, I spent most of my time volunteering and traveling to teach inner city kids. Um, it's not as altruistic as it sounds. That's just what I did. Um, so this is me. My head shape hasn't changed much since I was a little kid. Um, and this is my first trip in Kenya in 2007. I did the corporate world gig for a little while while working at Caterpillar, and it wasn't for me. Um, I'm too unreasonable for that. Um, and then this is me doing some biofuel research in Western Kenya, gaining friends along the way, installing solar panels in, in Kenya again, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro to promote education for a school that I taught at in Western Kenya, and then finally having fun. The fun ties in everything. If you, can't, if you don't have a passion for what you do and have fun while you're doing it, you're not going to be able to affect, have greater change than you, than you, than's possible. So. All right, so uh, we're Light Up Africa, and our mission is simple. We're powering people beyond light poverty. And for many of you in this room, you may not know that over the past 60 years, roughly $60 trillion, $60 trillion has been given in foreign aid to Africa alone. Think about all these problems, water poverty, food poverty, light poverty, access to energy. $60 trillion can't solve that? There's a problem. There's a gap in the way things are brought into the developing world and how we educate people to empower themselves. So in East Africa, where, where we operate, there's 50 different products that claim to end access to electricity in the use of fuel, as well as in light poverty. 50 different products. And these products, they're not offering the right solutions. They're not offering the right solutions and they're not offering the right services. So why is it? Why do we keep throwing the same solutions and the same products at the same problems and thinking they'll change? That's the definition of crazy. So at Light Up Africa, what we're doing, what we're developing is something unique. It's not innovative because I'm not a big fan of the word innovative. Innovative usually trumps good products and kicks them out the door, especially when you work in the developing world. You may have a product that brings access to electricity, it allows children to study at night, it allows for families to travel less because they can charge their phones at home, but a new innovative technology comes into the market that's a flashier color, it's got a lower price point, and then what always happens is that product gets kicked to the curb and then these people are forced to buy this new product. So we thought long and hard, we traveled to Kenya, we went back and forth, 
we did a lot of human-centered design research. Every week, I would spend time calling NGOs throughout Africa. I would call my contacts. I would travel back and forth. Uh, and what we found was a single standalone product won't solve light poverty. A platform will. And when I say light poverty, I, I refer to light poverty as a debilitating condition that adversely affects every quality of someone's life. So when you don't have access to energy, you don't have access to light to study, you don't have access to, to charge your mobile phones, women have to travel long periods of time to get cooking wood, to get wood for cooking, um, and so on and so forth. So access to light is crucial for building an ecosystem and community de development as well. So I touched briefly um, on the platform. Uh, at Light Up Africa, we have developed a platform-based solution that we believe will someday end light poverty. The way it works is we energize consumers into entrepreneurs. Everyone throughout the developing world in the world is an entrepreneur. You, you see it in India, you see it in Africa, you see it in South, Af South America, you see it in, in Chicago. People are always trying to sell stuff. They're always trying to be business-like. And then finally, we've cre this platform allows for the movement, the day-to-day -day movement of these people to be stored in, in, within our product and then converts that day-to-day -day movement into electricity. So this is a brief snapshot of kind of what we've de developed um, over the past year. Um, it's a mobile and a mobile technology. And, and what makes this so unique is that when you give a, a farmer a solar panel and he's forced to watch that solar panel from 12 to 5 when the sun is the highest in the sky, he has to make a choice. Do I go and farm or do I sit here and watch my solar panel so it doesn't get stolen? So we went to the drawing board and we said, this doesn't make sense. They have all these solar panels, they're getting stolen. In, in Kenya, there's over 100 days without access to, 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 light, to, to the sun because it's cloudy. One third of the year, it's cloudy in Kenya. That means these families pay three to six months most often for these products and they can't even use them a third of the year. So we said, what can we do differently and how can we do it differently? So we've created this product that's mobile. It stays in your home. It, I apologize, it's immobile. It stays in your home. It doesn't go anywhere. You don't have to worry about it going outside. You don't have to worry about someone stealing it. It's out of sight and it's out of mind. And that's our docking station, or Tapoa, which means cool lights in Swahili. What makes this Tapoa unique as well is that it, it allows for lighting as well as the ability to charge mobile phones. So as I said earlier, when you give a farmer a solar lantern or a solar panel, he can't monetize his life with that. But when you give a farmer a tapoa, he's able to charge cell phones for his family, for his friends, increasing his income, and saving on his monthly income. And then kind of the unique factor of our product are, are these portable pods. And we get a lot of questions around this, so I'm going to try to be as succinct as possible. Um, these pods, it's, they work very simply. Um, it, how many of you in this room have heard of a shake light flashlight? Okay, good. It's kind of like that, um, but not, not exactly like that. So we've developed proprietary technology that allows for this product to store energy via movement, kinetic movement into electrical energy. So as a bicycle taxi driver, which there's many, many, hundreds of thousands of bicycle taxi drivers throughout Kenya, as well as throughout the developing world, when they strap this on the back of their bike, it's bouncing around, moving around, and it's generating, store, it's generating electricity uh, and storing it within this pod. At the end of the day, this bicycle taxi driver can take the pod home to his family, insert it into the Tapoa, and then now they have instant on-demand access to electricity. And this is so important because what the developing world can benefit from are micro-decentralized solutions. Because as long as there's corruption, which is always evident, um, the less you have the government involved, the more change you can make at a grassroots level, um, over time, obviously. So we tend to think of electricity here in the United States as permanent energy infrastructure, steel, copper, the basic nuts and bolts of, of how we perceive electricity to be. We wake up in the morning, we turn on a light switch, we get in our car, we turn on the ignition switch, and we drive. We drive. In rural Africa, in Kenya, where 85% of the population doesn't have access to this, it doesn't make sense to install systems like this because of many, many, many reasons, um, but I won't get into those. Um, so 
this is this is our distribution model, um, and we we plan we plan, we, we plan to um, po pilot our program in Western Kenya, and we're partnering with EcoFinder. They're a non-governmental organization, and in my experience in Africa over the past five years, um, I've seen a lot of ups and downs with NGOs and non-governmental organizations. There's a lot of great ones, and there's a lot of not a lot of there's not a lot of great ones. So um, EcoFinder is one of those great ones. And what makes it so unique by partnering with an NGO is it allows for the community to take ownership of the product or service that you're implementing into the market and that you're providing for, to people. So EqualFinder we're partnering with, and together with EqualFinder, we're going to identify, impact entrepreneurs who are already moving through the economy. These are people whose jobs are, are bicycle taxi drivers, fisher persons, um, farmers. They're constantly moving and, and um, their lifestyle is, is a mobile lifestyle um, consistent with a subsistence economy. So we, we identify these impact entrepreneurs and then these impact entrepreneurs are energized to bring electricity into the community because it allows for friends and family members to have access to quick on-demand electricity. The scaling won't happen this fast but we feel because our model is from the bottom of the pyramid up and it's community driven uh, which is I validated our model back in Kenya in November. There's a much higher chance of it scaling um, and growing throughout Kenya rather than a top-down approach um, when you have uh, products that are coming into the market through distributors and retailers. So again, simply our pilot program, um, which, I, which was this past November, has already taken place. We're going to launch, launch a second pilot program this year um, and that's in September and or October. And then finally, um, about 12 to 18 months out from now, we're going to have our final pilot program where we hope to bring um, access to electricity to um, uh, millions of Kenyans. Now, these uh, are the movers and shakers of Kenya that I've, I've briefly talked about. There's 650,000 bicycle taxi drivers, 850,000 fisher persons, and 27 million subsistence farmers in Kenya alone. And each one of these customer segments can use our pods, aff affix them to cattle around the necks so as they graze throughout the day, it's sitting there and hanging and moving around, putting them on boats as well as putting them on the backs of bicycle taxi drivers' bikes. What this equates to is a 100% increase in monthly income for each one of these customer segments, um, these impact entrepreneurs. So it's, it's quite amazing, um, we feel, and um, it has a, a large chance to scale given how it's in a mobile and a mobile technology. But these movers and shakers aren't the only ones who benefit from, from our product. Um, Kenyan families benefit as well. As I said, they save 12% of their monthly income. There's improved health because they're using less kerosene for lighting purposes. And uh, you notice, I didn't say we're eliminating kerosene. You have to tread very carefully when you say that because a lot of companies will say, we're going to eliminate kerosene. And that's impossible because we use kerosene here in the US. It's a different form of kerosene. It's lighter fluid. So you can't eliminate kerosene. It's an oil-run industry where they spend, they make billions of dollars a year and they spend just as much making sure that everyone buys kerosene. So we're eliminating kerosene, hopefully for lighting purposes. 45 hours less travel time per, per month. So Kenyans already move a lot. Why should someone have to travel 45 more hours per month to collect wood and to charge their mobile phone? It makes no sense. Think about waking up this morning and spending three hours getting to class to take a midterm. And then you gotta tr walk three hours back. That's six hours out of your day right there. But you do that 45 hours every month. It doesn't make sense. Increased study time at night. I, I, I don't talk about this a lot, but one of the main benefits of using our system is that children get, a, get the opportunity to study by light um, where they otherwise wouldn't have access to light to study by. Again, charging cell phones. And then finally, our system allows for an improved standard of living that starts from the community and grows up. But don't take my word for it. Um, take Emmanuel's word for it. This is um, kind of a snapshot as of our product um, in November when I traveled to Kenya. And this is our prototype. I asked Emmanuel, if, whether or not he would benefit from a product like this because his job is to carry that basket full of chargers that use AA batteries that charge a mobile phone one-time use and then it gets thrown away 
A lot of these are Chinese made or uh, they're made in Taiwan. Um, and there's a constant influx of them in the market. So when I was talking before about those 50 different products, um, between 30 and 40 of those come from China and they're most often replications of, <coughs> replications of products that have already existed in the past. So Emmanuel says we waste a lot of money on mobile phone charging and kerosene. And it's so true. I mean, it's true and it's unnecessary. So by giving Emmanuel this pod and putting it in his basket while he walks around for 15 hours a day, we're essentially creating a new form of currency for him, a locally tradable energy currency that he can trade as if it were money. Now this is a brief snapshot of our, our pilot program launch. In the next year, um, we, we look to, to have helped 200,000 homes, and that's four people in, in a home, as well as hired 500 entrepreneurs. So our model just isn't about giving someone something or providing someone something. It's about creating an economy, an ecosystem that otherwise wouldn't exist because of corruption and for, 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 for reasons, um, for many other reasons. And then finally, by year five, we look to have hired 4,000 entrepreneurs and lit nearly a million homes. We've been recognized by a lot of people in the social impact space um, because we are a social for-profit. We're not a for-profit. And in my experience, I don't say this because I'm standing up here and I own a for-profit company. Um, Not-for-profit models are amazing, but it's a broken model. And it's a broken model because it's a funnel where funds go in and you don't know where they go. And a lot of the times, 30 to 40% are administrative costs. And then here's another interesting tidbit. Um, the World Bank, USAID, USGov, a lot of this money that is supposed to be going to the developing world, it often gets stopped in Washington, D.C. It gets stopped because the people that are delegating the money, they don't think people in Africa and people in India know how to manage a portfolio and a large scale budget of a million dollars. So it stops there and it never gets dispersed to the people that it's supposed to go to. So we're a social for-profit, a hybrid model, where the money that we earn and the capital that we raise goes invests directly back into the company. And it allows us to track and monitor um, our resources and our revenue more closely because if we go, if we go, uh, if we go bankrupt, we can't help, help anyone. And we can't rely on a constant influx of grants. So um, we've been recognized by the Global Engagement Summit. I spent a week there last year. Um, I was a Think Impact Fellow. Um, we won a social innovation competition, quite a few more competitions, um, as well as a starting block fellow I was selected as. Um, and then some of our co collaborators have been Motorola. They work, us on, they work with us on product development and design. Um, we had a design charrette about two months ago with 20 of Motorola Solutions designers and engineers, uh, and they took our product. They took our product apart. So it was amazing. Um, Kenyan Women's Microfinance. We understand that by partnering with just one NGO, it creates a decentralized network. But eventually, we want to see that decentralized network move to a more distributed network. And in doing so, you have less chance, of, less nodes of failure as you grow out. So microfinance institutions will be one of the people that we partner with and one of the organizations that we, we partner with in Kenya. Dell has, has, has been kind enough to um, lend their services on our business plan and scaling out our business model. And then finally, Safaricom, or the AT&T of Kenya, um, we're in collaboration with them right now. So as, as, as much as I am standing up here today, I'm only one very, very small, small part of the equation. A background in engineering, but I shouldn't have been an engineer. I probably should have been a designer or something. Um, I designed the logo, and that's about, and my engineering on the product was a lot in the beginning, and now it's, okay, you guys do the engineering, and I don't want to do the fun design stuff. Um, so background in engineering, I've spent quite a few time, uh, quite a bit of time in the developing world. Frank Burr is our, our, our CTO. Um, he's been the president of Engineers Without Borders Great Lake Region for, uh, I think, two years now. Um, and he's been in the organization for seven years. Um, and he's got tons of engineering experience in the developing world as well. Um, our, our lead mentor and our, our principal advisor is Dr. Andrew Otiano, and he's like a father to me. He, um, I, I met him five years ago, um, and we have been friends since, and I travel with the Africa every year. Um, I, work, I teach at a school that him and his wife have built. Amazing person. Uh, Sophia Gauss is our vice, product of, uh, vice president of product development. Um, 
she has a, a little bit of uh, developing world's experience, but she's super passionate. Uh, so one of the things I found is you can have the smartest person in the world, but if they're not passionate, they're just going to show up and they're going to go through the grinds. She's extremely passionate and she's excited about what we're doing. In the next six to 12 months, we're looking on to bring on two key hires, which could be good for some of you in this room. Um, launch our pilot program, obviously, um, all while simultaneously scaling marketing and, communica marketing and communications. And there's a, there's, there's a system to my, to my madness up here. Um, Light Up Africa was selected as one of the eight teams from around the world to participate in the Impact Engine. So over the past four months, we've been uh, mentored by some of the, the brightest minds in Chicago, as well as um, the lighting and energy sector. So this is what they say we do, so we do it. Um, as long as we stay true to our mission. Uh, now finally, one of the closing thoughts that I want to leave with for you is, um, if there's any reason um, why and or you've heard of tech or energy companies in this space um, for why we're not uniquely qualified to capture the lighting market in Africa, um, here's three reason, reasons. We've developed an integrated tech and business model. We're harnessing motion in a mobile economy. We understand that Kenyans, Africans, Indians, everyone's moving. So why design a product that's fixed and doesn't go anywhere and doesn't move with them? And then finally, one of the, the again, the secret sauce is that we're, we're creating an energy economy. We're creating this, this new ecosystem where people can trade energy, again, as if it were a form of currency. So I feel like I blew through it, but um, if anyone has any questions that I don't answer today, feel free to email me at founders at golightafrica.com. Check out our website, and we have a weekly blog posting as well. So I like to tell people we're going to be the charity water of electricity. Um, just wait. We'll get there. So... Excellent. That's all I have. Um, I would love to take questions, um, make them as hard as you want. And if I can't answer, I'll answer them in email because I'm a much better speaker in email than I am in person. So, excellent. Yes. Um, have you built one of those pods yet that actually works? Right. That's a very good question. So our original model, the prototype which you saw in manual holding, that was our second or third generation. From, I, I wish I would have included a product development uh, chart because we're all this, many of us are all designers here and we would have benefited extremely from seeing that. Um, it started out as a box. I'm going to answer your question kind of a long way. It was actually only my first half of my life. Okay, good. I'll, I'll make a quick thing. My, my girlfriend is the person who's supposed to be like, Alan, be quiet because I tend to ramble on. So um, I'll make it very quick. We started out as a box, which was one, uh, one piece of technology and we found that, hey, it's gonna, it can get stolen more often as well as it can't produce enough energy and who wants to carry a box around? We've iterated, iterated, iterated to the pod. And then finally we got to, backtrack, backtack, backtrack, a couple more, it's still, we got to the Tapoa and the pods. The Tapoa is fully functional. The pods, we're working on optimizing that energy so output. Crank device, no crank device, I'm glad you said that. So in one of our focus groups, um, and some of the human-centered design research that I did in Kenya, one of the, what, in the focus group, there was 20 people, and one of the gentlemen was like, man, I would love a crank. Like, just put a crank on this thing. I'll just crank it all day long. And we're all looking at each other, and we all raised our hands for everyone who didn't like a crank, everyone but him. He loved it. So um, I actually brought a prototype that had a crank. And I was like, we got to figure this out. What's going on? Um, so we gave it to him, and we said, you crank for five minutes. After the five minutes, he hit the floor. He's like, I can't do this. Cranks make no sense. But the, the value add to that was he gave us a lot of great insight and design for how we can fix it if we were ever to interface a crank into this product. Make it longer, put more leverage on it, and things like that. So yes. yes. So I really wanted to finish my question, which was, is there any reason to think that that energy harvesting thing on the right there would ever be able to generate enough energy being carried by a rickshaw or a, you know, any of these that to be a useful amount of energy? In other words, have you done the so sort of order of magnitude calculation as to right. whether this generates one watt, 10 watt, or 10 milliwatts. Yes. So that just makes all the difference practically. It does. From an engineering standpoint, we're pretty good on our uh, dot and I's and crossing our T's. Um, it's w about one watt right now. And it may not seem like a lot, but when you're living a passive lifestyle, you don't want someone to sit there and crank something all day long. Because as you've seen from, from our research, that's not, that's not what people want to do. So, we can make this and design it in a way that it produces 50 watts, but someone would have to carry something that's this big and shake it all day long. 
and they're, that's essentially changing their lifestyle. We, we don't want to change people's lifestyle. We want to have a product that adapts to their li lifestyle rather than having a product that people have to adapt to their lifestyle. So very shortly, it, right now it produces a watt of energy, um, which is enough to charge a 600 milliamp phone um, once. And then at, there's a lot of light left over, about four hours of light left over per day to study with. So Kenyans charge the phones three, uh, three times a week on average. Uh, and this, this means that they can charge their phone three times a week at a minimum, as well as have 16 hours of light um, at a maximum. Uh, many Kenyans uh, or many people don't like to sleep in the dark, so they, they want a low, uh, a low light on at all times. This does that, as well as it provides a high light for eight hours. Two different light settings. Many products you'll see, they have four light switches, five light switches. Why? Why do you have five light switches? I asked people, I'm like, I asked Kenneth, I said, hey, can you tell me what the first light setting is? Oh yeah, it's great, it's great. I, I, I like to keep it on at night and, and it, it, my kids like it. Okay, okay, we got that. Well, why do you have the last light setting, the fifth light setting, the highest light setting? Oh, it's great, we can cook by it, we can study. Um, I can carry it outside so I don't step on snakes. All right, great. So what about the third, the second, the third, and the fourth lights? Well, we don't know. People don't know, and that's added cost to a product that we're a Competitive price point determines whether or not a product will in the market. So just a prime example of listening to what the user is telling you rather than designing a product for what you think the user wants. Hopefully I answer your question. Okay, good. Yes. How can they afford your system? How much is it? How much are they being changed? Great question. I think every question is going to be a great question today, so bear with me. Yeah. We're, we've designed the price point to be a competitive price point based on how we sell the product, and that's to NGOs initially. Um, and with economies of scale and over time, the product will go down in price and be more affordable for the end consumers. But what consumer wants to pay two to three months worth of wages for a product like this? No one. Price point $68. Extremely expensive for people in the developing world. I, I admit that 100%. But we're not selling to people, we're not selling directly to end consumers. We're selling through NGOs who get millions and millions of dollars a year to bring products like this into fruition. So, um, and it also allows for low capital costs for the end consumer. We understand that, in, uh, that um, people in the developing world that earn less than $2 a day, they can't afford a product like this. So taking out that element of the equation um, and having our impact entrepreneurs move through the economy and lease these products out on a daily basis, as if you would buy kerosene, is much more powerful and it will scale much more quickly by doing it that way. So um, $68. The NGO buys a specified amount of products, and then they lease those to the impact entrepreneurs. These people are moving. They're people who the community trusts. They understand. They put a lot of confidence in them to do the right thing. These impact entrepreneurs then lease out the Tapoa and the pods for less than the price of kerosene. So we've incentivized people who would otherwise use kerosene to not use kerosene anymore because it's cheaper to use this. Yes. So, so just to clarify, the NGO is, le is leasing the system to the entrepreneur, and how is the entrepreneur paying those payments? Right. And, yeah. Yeah, uh, very valid question. So right now, we have the, the impact entrepreneur paying a quarter of their monthly er earnings or commission back to the NGO. Um, why 25%? Because that's a number that people understand. Um, it's a number that makes a lot of sense. And when they're already making Without the 25%, they would be making three times the amount of money. Um, so the goal is, is to energize an economy and grow an economy from the use of the product and not have people use it immediately and then go and live in the big cities and leave their families and everyone else who relies on them um, uh, in the dark. So, yeah. How many pods do they get from the system? Two. Two pods per system. Each pod does, um, each pod does four hours of, of um, let's think about this real fast because we just changed the calculations. Um, two pods per system, maximum 18 hours. Each pod does eight hours on a, a low setting and then four hours on a high setting. Yes? I have two questions. One is where are they being produced? And two, are these entrepreneurs, are they trained? So like if they break, are they, do they, do they have product, uh, knowledge of products? And Wonderful question. I like that one. That's one of my favorite ones. Um, Yes, they're being produced right now in the U.S. for our pilot program. Um, it, yep, because we kind of have we have the capital to be able to make them here. 
eventually we want to move manufacturing to Kenya, but it's very difficult. Um, a lot of the big name organizations are actually moving out of Kenya because of rolling brownouts and blackouts. So our vision is to move into Kenya within three to five years to begin manufacturing. But for now, we'll manufacture in China as well as Taiwan, um, and we'll keep the manufacturing process separate. Um, it's not going to safeguard us completely. Um, at some point in time, they will be replicated, but we want to mitigate that. Um, and then your second part of your question was a good one. What it was. Yes. What, one of the things you don't see um, with companies that are um, selling solar lanterns and, and solar energy type of devices and, um, and products throughout the developing world is that they don't have a back end model. They essentially sell products through a third party, and then this third party then sells them to NGOs throughout Kenya. These products break because there was no training on it. You overcharge, you undercharge solar, you undercharge the products. So a product that was supposed to last two or three years only lasts one year. This lowers consumer confidence so much. So that's why you have 50 different products in the market. I took a video when I was in Kenya of in the market, there's a shelf, a huge shelf the size of this, this screen right here. Um, and there's, there's tons of different solar lighting products on there. Energizer was on there, Duracell was on there, D-Light was on there, out of Stanford. Um, and then all the way to the right, there was kerosene lanterns. Nine times out of 10, people walk up, they play with it, they love it, but they get the kerosene lantern. Because consumer confidence has been lowered so much because of failed products. So what we offer at Light Up Africa is a back-end model to repair, service, and replace our products. We're not just giving people something and then running and going into the next country and scaling and establishing marketing fit to, to, to earn profit and to appease investors. We want to make sure that we're developing an ecosystem, that we're supplying jobs, that we're creating that ecosystem that will allow for growth rather than to meet some gross margin or profit margin. One of the things you started out with was the um, anecdote of the farmer washing his solar panels so they get stolen while they're in the fields. What prevents somebody who's, as you said, maybe doubling, doubling their salary, keeping this from getting stolen? Right. I mean, they are, are preventing some sort of negative social um, interaction where people envy him or don't want to do. I, mean, I, I don't have one of those. You have one of those, and so it becomes competitive. Right. So, yeah, it's going to happen. Um, the goal is is to lower the, the price point of the pods themselves to a low enough value where people aren't incentivized to steal them. And when you, when you disconnect the charging mechanism with the lighting mechanism and mobile phone charging mechanism, um, it's less chance to be stolen because when you have an empty pod and you can't do anything with it, what's the purpose of stealing it? People are going to steal it. We're going to put these in the market and they're going to do things with it we never thought they would. The goal is to learn from that um, and, and, and understand and then grow out those nuances and hopefully design and develop better solutions. Can you explain the Zoom system you mentioned on the website? Yeah. And the second? This is the Zoom system. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, we're in a branding crisis right now. So what is that right name for the company and the product that, that really makes change? Um, so yeah, I don't mean to cut you off, but I think you have the second part of your question? Yeah, I have the second okay. question. I actually worked um, for two years in Ghana, West Africa, yeah. and uh, I was working in the uh, electricity sector. Yeah. So my question, my second question would be, what is your plan to maybe extend your this into other African countries? Yeah. Great question again. Um, we're going to start off small, and we're going to grow organically. We don't want to push things. We don't want to pressure things. We want to work on these levers and gears that allow us to grow organically. So um, first step is East Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda. That market's 223 million people. We can spend 10 to 15 years entering that market. Um, or we can do what a lot of companies do and establish market fit, scale, um, and that's usually 0.01% to 1%. Um, and then go all the way to India and start selling products in India. Like, oh, okay, we sold 5% in India. Let's go to South America now. No. Uh, all East Africa, we're light up Africa, we'll stay in Africa. Um, uh, I'm unreasonable in that sense, and I get a lot of trouble for it because people who want to make money don't agree with that. They say, hey, the best way to make money is to go in Kenya and then offshoot to India and then go to the next most profitable country and continue to do that. So. It's been difficult in the fundraising stage, um, being that unreasonable in that sense and growing. So yeah, we'll, we'll get there, Ghana eventually. Oh, we got some good contacts in Ghana, so. Right. Yeah. So did you 
would you say that the NGOs lease out the system to the impact entrepreneurs who then lease it out further into their community? Right. So how do you ensure that those impact entrepreneurs aren't taking advantage of this opportunity and charging um, people in their community like different prices depending on where they are? Yes. Yeah, like how do you protect that part of the system? Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned before, um, you can't become an impact entrepreneur unless you're someone within a community that the community trusts. Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're charging twice for the, prop, for the pot of the system that would normally cost, people aren't going to buy it. Um, Kenyans are smart, they're savvy, they're business people. If they see that your, your next door neighbor's got this for 68, but you got it for 138, 148, um, they're not going to they're, they're not going to buy it. They're not going to play into that. You will have those nuances within the system where people try to take advantage of it. But that's why whenever we go into the community and partner with the NGO, we're really going to focus on who those first 25 impact entrepreneurs are because that's the most important part of the process. Um, if something goes wrong there, then it doesn't scale. And you're left with products that, are, that fail and they're never going to the market. So I validated this model when I was in Kenya in November, this leasing model to impact entrepreneurs, and it went amazing. Um, there was a huge reception, reception of it, um, and yeah, we're excited to all the same say. How do they currently charge their cell phones, and what are they paying for that? Right, so they pay between three times a week, and they pay between 200 and 400 shillings, which is 860 to how, how is it done? About, uh, they travel. Um, so usually there's a battery, a car battery that's set up. Um, someone has a car battery, someone has access to uh, the permanent energy infrastructure, the grid, or there's solar kiosks starting to pop up where they have to travel to. So it's three different mediums of how people charge their phones. The most common one is from a car battery um, with 15 to 20 phones set up um, that they're charging on a consistent basis. And so the way it would work now for the entrepreneur is that people would come to their home. Homes, shacks, and yeah, whatever, and then, and how long does it take to charge the battery? They it, charge the cell phone? Yeah, it just depends on the quality of phone. Most of Africa has first generation cell phones, the flip phones, the Razor phones, um, the Nokia's, um, 600 milliamp hours, it can take five to eight hours to charge, just depending on what type of battery and how much the battery is depleted and things like that. So usually about eight hours to fully charge it. And that's more expensive. Um, Kenyans don't try, they try, in my experience, I, I speak in reference to Kenyans quite a bit. Um, that's because I partially consider myself Kenyan, but that's a different story. So, um, yeah, yeah, it just depends. Eight hours, and they usually travel between two and three hours to get their phone charged, and then they, they pay in upwards of 400 shillings or five to six dollars once, three times a week to charge their phones. Because if they're like, hey, if we're going to charge our phone, we might as well get a soda while we're here. We might as well get food while we're here. We, so yeah, it's expensive. If you had it in the home and you're charging phones for everybody, then it'd be amazing. We'll get there though. Excellence. Yes, Sam? Um, so is the idea that each home has one of these or, or a, a, along with the battery or you know, is there just kind of one vendor where everyone, they're just selling these pods or, or like why can't one kind of share the actual why right, it doesn't necessarily have to be in every home. Um, and the way this, the family structures are in Kenya, when you talk about home, it, it, it can mean 200 people living in a home. And then you have a house, which means five or 10 people. Um, it might be the inverse of that. I, I get confused on it all the time. Um, so yeah, I, I, don't, I don't, in my experience, I don't think 200 people can use this in a family. So we probably need more into the market, obviously. But we're not out to make money, so I'm not trying to put one in every home in hopes of people will buy one and we'll make more money and more profit. Um, the goal is, is to get everyone who doesn't have access to electricity access to it. So if, if it's a family of 200 and they have to buy 10 of these um, for the entire family to have access to electricity, then I think that's a good investment. Yes? What do your investors say when you say you're not having money? I don't know where you're watching this. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, 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 you have to be who you are. And um, I believe in making money if it's for good. Um, there are impact investors out there who understand um, that if they give you money, um, they're expecting a low rate of return, sometimes between 5 and 7% over the course of 10 years. They're there. They're very few and far between. 
most often we have to go across overseas. Chicago is a tough community to get into in terms of impact investing. Um, you have to go overseas to a portfolio fund um, where they have five or six different companies in the energy sector and then they usually understand the nuances of, um, hey, I don't want to make money on a social for profit, but we want to do good, so help us. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's, it's, like, it's, yeah, it's all over the place. Expound on your thoughts about trade. I liked your idea of like bartering the pods. Yeah, we don't want to force kind of that element of how our product can enter the market and evolve over time. But we're really excited about that. Um, subsistence economies are barter-based economies. You give me a cow and, well sadly, I'll give you my daughter, but we don't want it to be like that. We want it to be you give me a cow and I'll give you energy. You give me, you give me bananas and I'll give you energy for the night so your kid can study. Um, so yeah, we want it to grow organically because we fear if we kind of push that, that part of the platform into the market, it will dissuade people from, from wanting to use the product. So yeah, the barter-based economy and using this as an energy currency, um, I don't think any other company is doing it because um, they're so fixed on, there's a solar lantern, it works. It works when it works, when the sun's out. It's a low price point now because over time, obviously things get cheaper, um, uh, but yeah. We're creating something new here, essentially. The docking station is essentially a battery in length. Is that kind of the, the, the guts of it? I mean, something to hold, to store the energy, sure. and then a, a light to, to be for the house. Is that right? Right. right. Um, did you think about putting a light on the pod? Because of the, the battery, obviously, is the expensive piece of the, because um, if you have light on the pod, then you can have the light be given to other people without taking the docking station out. Or for an attachment onto the pod that would be like. You're yeah, absolutely right. Um, we're, we're iterating our design a tiny bit. Um, we we're going to finish final. We're going to finalize product development in March. Um, in the system you're describing, it's leaning more towards that system where there's a light on the pod. Um, one of the things we wanted to do was we wanted to not use batteries. Batteries aren't sustainable all the time. It's unfortunately people use them because it's the best technology out there now. We were really looking into capacitors. Um, but sadly, capacitors are about a thousand orders of magnitude off in terms of energy storage. So hopefully one day someone, maybe in this room, will design a super capacitor that can store um, enough energy to, for, these, for, these, for these pods to work at, at one watt hour. Um, it's not out there yet, though. So there's, there's no energy storage in the... Yeah, there's, uh, right now there's a battery, um, a, a, a larger system of batteries. Um, 1.5 volts, three batteries uh, within the docking station, and then um, within the pod, it's uh, capacitor right now for quick energy transfer and energy storage as well. So what are they made of? How long do they last? How do you dispose of them? Right. So right now, we anticipate, and everyone looks at these numbers and they gawk, like, what, 10 years? That's impossible. No, how can it last 10 years? Um, that's for the plastic casing. We know the batteries are going to die. The goal is to use the best quality battery so it doesn't die as quickly. And one of the benefits of using a non-solar technology is you decrease the chance of overcharging and undercharging um, during that energy transfer process and that energy storage process. Um, so the pod, uh, about 10 years for the plastic, ABS polycarbonate. Um, it's going to crack, obviously. Um, that way we need to really work on those pain points in terms of the design process. Uh, we have a pretty Pretty cool designer um, from Purdue. I know, sorry, Purdue. Um, she's all we could get. No, she's amazing. She's absolutely amazing. Helen does amazing work. She's designed this. Um, but yeah, obviously you can see there's a lot of unused plastic here. This next design that we put into the market, um, uh, we're going to decrease the size considerably as well as the unused uh, and unmet need of having the plastic that doesn't serve a purpose. Um, and the docking station lasts for about five years, and that's again on, on um, the, the light will last 10 to 15 years. Um, the plastic should hold up, especially if it's in a home, this one should last five years. Um, and you have to replace the battery after about two to three years. Um, and then I spoke briefly earlier on our back-end model. Our back-end model, we're gonna have an in-country warehouse where these products are assembled. So Kenyans are, we're, we're employing Kenyans again um, to assemble these products rather than having them assembled in China. Um, and then we'll have a, a warehouse where there'll be back, back of the batteries. Um, as well as LED lights and things like that. I, I, um, I volunteered in an NGO in Kenya, and there's a product called the Tough Stuff. Um, awesome name, you think it lasts forever. Um, but an NGO got 100 Tough Stuffs, 
and after the first week, they didn't even last a week, they all failed. Um, and this company's won a lot of awards. Check them out, they've won a lot of awards and um, awesome product conceptually, but they didn't design for the end user and for the environment that the, that the product's um, uh, they're thrown into. So um, yeah, it, I think I digressed, but yeah. Five years and 10 years, the batteries, two to three years, we'll have in, in country warehouse storing batteries as well as products to replace and service as, as we go along. And how do you dispose of that? The batteries? Yeah. Very good question. Right now, we're not putting them in landfills. We haven't developed a good enough strategy for what we're gonna do with them because we're not sure how many batteries are gonna go in the market. Um, I know a lot, a lot of companies have 12 volt car batteries that they're starting to design solar lanterns around um, that go in people's homes. That's a whole other uh, topic of conversation as well. But we're trying to optimize what's the best way to make this as environmentally friendly as possible. So they won't go in a landfill, I can guarantee you that. Um, hopefully somewhere along the line we can figure out how to re-energize these batteries, at least a minimum capacity, that way they're getting use out of it over a sustained period of time. Yeah, uh, you were saying the docking station can last like uh, five years. So do you, do you see that in five years the companies can that will not improve the situation of life? Uh, I, I hope they would. That's what we're designing for. We're designing to meet them at an intersection, obviously. Um, we, yeah, so I, I would say it's 15 to 20 years out um, before everyone throughout Kenya, at least Kenya, um, has reliable access to energy. Um, elections are coming up again, and you're starting to see the economy as well as socioeconomic um, um, Try to say that you see the economy kind of going down now um, because of the elections. So when that happens, you kind of go reverse and you back up a couple of years every time kind of elections come out. Um, so yeah, the goal is to eventually design the product that meets at an intersection with permanent energy infrastructure, um, and then we're not needed anymore. I would love if we were out of business. That means people have access to electricity. That's that's what we want. And sorry, how do you uh, you know decrease the involvement of governments like you mentioned? <coughs> I mean, you're talking about election. When the election happens, maybe you have to come back to the U.S. and uh, you go back to the Yeah, I've been there during election time, and it's not pretty. Um, that's, 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 those are long stories. But yeah, you know, someone has to be there. Someone has to do it. And as long as we continue to kind of work from an outside scope inward, um, we're not doing everything that we can do. So Light Up Africa will go into the Democratic Republic of Congo. We'll go into Pakistan. We'll go into Afghanistan eventually. Um, we can't be afraid um, of elections and, and corrupt political regimes and wars um, to provide people with access to what should be inherently theirs to begin with energy. So. Well, I'm going to cut questions off now because I know people always like to come up and talk to the speaker. So if you have any questions, feel free to come up and talk down. But let's see what they have before. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I have some more candy up here if you want. I,